short word of prayer before we turn to God's word. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that we can gather together here this morning. Uh, We thank you for your word and just we thank you just for being able to read it here together. And we pray now, Lord, as we turn to the preaching from your word, it will just be a word that will bless our hearts, will challenge our hearts, will help us in our own Christian path and our own Christian love as we share it with one another. And we do pray, Lord, that As we look to your word this morning, it will be a lamp unto our feet and it will be a light unto our very path because we ask it in your lovely name. Amen. Amen. Folks, if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn with me to uh, John 13 uh, as we just take a a quick recap uh, over what we've been looking at. We're nearly at the end of the word uh, disciple. A disciple is someone who is devoted to Christ. We looked at first of all. Uh, They believe in Christ and they belong to Christ. And I trust in all of our hearts that we believe in Christ with all of our heart. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And I trust that we belong to Christ. Because once we believe, we belong. And we become part of the family of God. A disciple is someone who is devoted to Christ. A disciple is someone who gets involved for Christ. And we looked at the two little thoughts there and many others. But faithful towards God. And we also looked at wise towards our fellow man. So it's important in our daily life and in our Christian life that we get involved for Christ. We get involved in the things of God and we're faithful towards God. Uh, You often sing that hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And God is a faithful God. But in our lives and in our Christian life, we need to be those who are found faithful. And then we need to be wise towards our fellow man. How we live our Christian life. As far as the world sees us as Christians, are we living as those who are wise and make a difference and an impact upon the ungodly? A disciple, thirdly, is someone who is spirit-filled. And we do need to be indwelt by the Spirit. And that's at salvation when the Holy Spirit comes into our heart. And then he fills, he continues to infill us as we're involved in his service, as we're doing something for him. There's the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And thirdly, we looked at the little thought of empowering us for service. If there's some special task that the Lord has asked you to do for him, he will empower you to be able to do that task for him. So a disciple is someone who is filled with the Spirit or the Holy Spirit. A disciple is someone who is Christ-centered. In other words, we looked at that little thought, preeminence, that he might be first in our lives. And I trust, folks, as, as a child of God, We endeavour to put him first and foremost in our lives. Sometimes we put him well down the list, don't we? But it's important that he is first and foremost. As we live our Christian life, that we keep Christ in the centre of all that we do for him. Fifthly, we looked at the thought a disciple is someone who invites others. You might say, well, being involved for Christ, is that not inviting others? But, you know, it's, it's a different thing because many times we're involved for Christ and we're doing. But have we ever invited someone to come to Christ? Have we ever spoken to someone about Christ? Have we ever invited somebody to come and sit under the sound of the gospel? And as I shared that a number of weeks ago, I said, you know, many of the people who, who, have, who have trusted the Lord over the years, they've been a privilege of being in ministry, have been those who others have invited to come and brought in under the sound of 
God's word. So someone who invites others, ye shall be witnesses unto me, uh, there in, in uh, Ephesians. It says also a disciple is someone who prays. And we've been looking at a number of weeks for a prayer, but prayer is something that's very important for all of our Christian lives and Christian experience. We, we looked at private prayer, uh, our own prayer time each and every day. We also looked at personal prayers when uh, Peter cried out, Lord, save me. When David cried out, Lord, search me. So we have all these different prayers. And they are personal prayers which come from the very heart. We also had public prayer. Peter was in prison. Prayer was made of the church. And it's important that we come together for public prayer. And last week we looked there at hindrances to prayer. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And you know, it was, uh, it was just wonderful there. Even on Thursday night as Norman uh, was preaching, Norman was down for a few days. And he was preaching there on Thursday night at the prayer meeting. And he was dealing with the same issues as I was dealing there on the Sunday, the hindrances to prayer. And he quoted those same verses. And it's important that we know what it is to be right with God and to be living a right life. And as we come before God in the place of prayer, to be those who are living for him. And as we move on uh, there this morning, a disciple is someone who loves. And we can put not only a love for, for, for God, but we can also put the idea of a love for others. And we go back there to verse 34 and 35. It says, a new commandment of John 13. I give unto you that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know. And that's where we started off, that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. And I suppose that's one of the biggest things in the Christian life, isn't it? It's love for others, and it's love for one another. Ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. The little thought that came to me there as I was looking at this uh, little thought was just a new commandment. And I thought to myself, well, were the old Ten Commandments not enough as we looked into it? But it's not that God has given us a new commandment. It's not the idea of a new commandment here, but we're to continue on in the, in the commandments that have been given. And they were as appropriate as the day they were giving there in Exodus 20 as they are today. You see, many people say, oh, well, you can't apply the Old Testament to the New Testament church or the New Testament Christian. And yet, I want you to turn back with me to Exodus 20. And I want you to look with me just for a few minutes at the commandments there. We're not going to be really looking at them in, in detail or in anything else. But we're just going to be going through them a wee minute. Because one of the things about the commandments that you can divide them up is the word love. The first four commandments as you look at them and read them there together in Exodus 20 are our love for God. And first and foremost our love for others will only come out of the love we have for God. And if God lives and reigns in our hearts and our lives, we, we love him because he first loved us. It's a reciprocal love. And if that love is deep down in our hearts, well, then we will show out that love to others. There in the commandments there, it says, And God spake all these words in Exodus 20. I am the Lord thy God, which had brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And there the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thyself any graven image, the likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third or fourth generation of them that hate me. And show mercy unto thousands of them that love me. And keep my commandments. Again we have the word commandments. We have the third commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless. That taketh his name in vain. Folks are we living in a world today. Where, where the name of the Lord is taken in vain. And very much I suppose in the land. And in the society we're living in. You know, we go into company and, and, and many times we, we, we do correct people. But the Lord's name is just taken in vain time and time again. And here it says, we love the Lord, we do not take his name in vain. Verse 8 says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor, do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. 
In it thou shalt do no, not any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, thy maidservant, nor the cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. You know, folks, in many of our societies today, the Sabbath day is, is not looked on as the Sabbath day. In other words, Sunday is completely looked. I remember when I was growing up, sometimes when you're preaching, you get nostalgic, don't you? You look when you were growing up and you look at your childhood days and, you know, the, the Sabbath day was, was, was a day when you didn't do anything. Sunday was, was a day to be honored. It was a day to be reverenced. It, it was a day to worship God. And I could give you a big long list of things that you did not do. Because I grew up with them. And I see some of you smiling down there. Because you all grew up with them too. And the Sabbath day and the Sunday was to be referenced. Why? Because we were to think upon God. You know sometimes I, I don't know whether you call it argue or have a discussion. Now oh you can rest any day. It doesn't really matter. You know, we come to worship here on a Sunday. We, we don't open up the church every single morning for one or two to come in. But, you know, we, we set the Sunday aside. I remember a fellow at home many years ago, a neighbor, and he, he came in and he said, you know, he said, I walked out in your, in your dad's field there yesterday. He said the sun was shining. And he said, I had three combines sitting there ready to cut it. But I knew if I went out in your father's field, he'd run me. You see, even the neighbors knew what you stood for. You see it's our love for God. And you had the opportunity. And folks that's the great reality here. In the commandments. We love God. We love God. And then if you go down through. I'm not going to go through them all. But from 30 verse 13. Down to the end of verse 17. It's our love for our fellow man. And if we have a right love for God. Then we'll have a love for our fellow man. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. All of those commandments flow from it. So in other words, we love God. And because we love God, we will have a love for our fellow man. And that's the dividing up of these wonderful commandments. I wonder, folks, do we have a great love for God? Does it shine out in our lives? Do we live it out? You know a commandment is a statement given with authority. This is God's word. And God has given his word folks that you and I may live out that word. And one of the greatest things is that we shine love out to others. How do we do it? We do it by keeping his commands. We do it by, by living out the word of God. And one of the verses that always speaks to me every time and is important to me is be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. How many times have you heard people quoting to you the scriptures? But they don't live it out. They know it. They know what it stands for. But they don't live that word out. And you see if we love God we will live his word out. And then reciprocally we will have a love for one another. Ye are my disciples if ye have love one for another. Folks, I want to look at a few wee verses. And I want you to turn to Romans 14. Do we have a love one for another? Because I want to look at four different types of people in, in the Christian faith that, that need to be shown love. The first one here in Romans 14 and verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Now, towards the weaker brother. That's the first one I want to show. Towards the weaker brother. If you take that word, him that is weak in the faith. Not fully established in his faith. Now this person can be young in the faith, but this person can have, have, have spent many years in the faith, but yet has not grown spiritually. As the scripture says, they the, 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 the need the sincere milk of the word. They're not able to get into the meat of God's word that they may grow. If we continue, you know the illustration, well, if we continue to give a baby milk, well then they won't grow up. The first thing they will do, they'll want to get into, the, get, get into food, won't they? 
You give them milk for so long and then and then you start giving them you start giving them food. And then after a wee while, if, if they're big enough, you, you can't feed them. We had roots, we fell up there for the week, and he'd, he'd eat you out of house and home there. You couldn't, you couldn't keep him fed. I said, will you stop growing and stop eating, or you'll have to go home. But you know, he, he was there, and, and you fed him. You know, it wasn't just milk anymore. He was eating everything. And we all need to eat. So we need the sincere we do. But the weaker brother here, he's still on the milk of the world. And it's our responsibility to get him from the, the milk onto the meat. That's what discipleship is. That's what's making a disciple is. You see, not fully established in the faith. Uh, not with a clear view of, of the Christian faith. And that's why we come together to study the word. And someone who is weaker does not have a clear view. What do we do with them? Here it says here, him that is weak in the faith, receive ye. Admit, admit or bring them into the fellowship. It says bring them in amongst you. Receive in and show them true kindness. That's the reality here for the weaker brother or the weaker sister. And then it goes on to say, and I was looking at the, the NIV, but the NIV says the very same. Not too doubtful disputation. Now I had to look that up. I didn't have any clue at all where those words were going. I know the word doubtful means, means not too sure about it. But the word doubtful disputations is not to debate the matter in a harsh or an angry manner. Sometimes if somebody doesn't fully understand, we, we can raise the voice, don't we? We can get worked up. I remember my father told me something years and years ago and I've never forgotten it and I've probably shared it here a number of times but he said he was having an argument or a discussion I suppose we'll put it that way first with, with an elderly gentleman and he, said, and he said you know I knew I was right and he said the very minute he says when I knew I was right he said I raised my voice and he said the elderly gentleman he put his hand on my shoulder and he said young fella he said the minute you raised your voice you lost the argument. How true that is, isn't it? And somebody who's weaker in the faith, folks, we don't need to raise the voice with them. We need to help them by, by showing them the word of God. We don't need to confirm their doubt, but we need to strengthen their belief in God. That's the weaker brother. That's our responsibility, to show that love and that kindness out in the best way possible. The second thing here, folks, is towards the offended brother. And I want you to turn with me back to uh, Proverbs 18 and verse 19. And it says, a brother, Proverbs 18 and 19, it says, A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. And their contentions are like the bars of a castle. Their contentions are like the bars of a castle. In other words, somebody who has been offended or has taken offense. Maybe rightly, maybe wrongly, but they've, they've taken offense. They're harder to be won back than a strong city. And what he's talking about here, he's talking about the, the cities that were built. And we go in and we visit many of the castle there. I was up in Edinburgh and I was up at the, the castle there not that long ago. And you see the big walls built up. Well, that's the idea is putting it. In other words, somebody who's been offended, what they do? They build up a wall. It's like the windows with bars that put the bars up. Listen, nobody's coming in. I'm offended here. I'm offended here. But what has it caused? It's caused division, hasn't it? Whether the offence is rightly taken, as I said earlier, whether it's wrongly taken, it still caused discord and it still caused disunity. You see, unity makes strong. Unity makes strength. It gives strength. And it says where the brethren dwell together in unity, there the Lord commands a blessing. You know, sometimes it's easy to take offence. It's easy to give offence. And we can spend our life being offended when we need to deal with that offence. You know, we have an old saying in our house, and you've heard me saying it a number of times, you need to build a bridge and get over it. It's hard to do that when you've been offended. But can I say for your own Christian life and your own Christian experience, that's what we need to do. 
because there needs to be unity. Mr. Lewis told me a, a wonderful story many years ago, and I've shared it in many, many places, and probably have here too. But there was two people sitting in one of the churches he, he ministered there in, uh, over in Scotland many years ago. And he said he preached his sermon. He said it was like an ordinary Sunday. And he said at the end of the sermon he was going to close in a wee word of prayer. And he said as he was closing, ready to close in a wee word of prayer, he said a man got up and he stood up and he came walking out. And he came walking up to the front. And he got up to the, the mic and he said, listen, can I speak to so and so? And so and so was sitting over the very far side opposite. And he said they got out. And they came back up and there'd been an offence for many, many years between the two men. And he said one put his arms around the other. And he said the tears flowed. And he said I closed my eyes and I started to pray. And he said you know when I finished praying I opened my eyes. The two men were still their arms around each other. But he said the whole congregation barring four people. We're up at the very front. We're up at the front. And he said God came in. In such a wonderful way. And revival came down. He said many of the young people. I went back years later. Were wonderfully saved. You see it's wonderful. When people can come together. It's hard sometimes. To win back the offended brother. But that's what we need to be able to do. Thirdly here. Towards the trespassing brother. If you want to turn back to Matthew 18. Matthew 18 and 15. And it says there in Matthew 18 and 15. It says moreover. If thy brother shall trespass against thee. Go and tell him his fault. Between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee. Thou hast gained a brother. A brother. Can I say the word brother means a number of things here. It means a fellow Christian. It means a fellow believer. It means part of God's family. And I was reading a little commentary there a couple of weeks ago. And it put it like this. United with the same feelings. United with the same objects. And united with the same destiny. So, and I thought that that's it's not a wonderful explanation of what a brother or sister in Christ uh, is. They're united with the, with the very same feelings. Because we have a love for God and we, we have a love for one another. With the same objects to see the work of God going forward. And to see people blessed and to see the gospel preached. And the very same destiny. Where are we going? We're heading on the upward way. New heights we're gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. That's the same destiny. Folks, the destiny is heaven. So we're talking about brothers and sisters in Christ. Shall trespass injure you in, in any way? It says by words and it says by deeds. And, and in the original it says, it says actually to sin against you. So in other words, this other brother and Chris, or sister in Christ, they've sinned against you. What do you do? You go and tell them. Seek an explanation. Look, look for a reason. Friendly, brotherly, that's what it's about. Alone, by yourself. You know, sometimes when we're looking for a reason and explanation, we, we, we can take a posse with us, can't we? We can think, listen, I'm going to bring a pile of people here. And the world says, you know, you bring a witness and you get everything else. But the Bible says here, look, do it alone, between you and him. Between you and him. And, and, and sort it out. And the word here that I love, it says that you may gain. Thou hast gained thy brother. And that word to gain is to preserve or to be stored, to be reconciled. And that's what brothers and sisters in Christ should be. We should be reconciled together. You know, there can be the weaker brother. We can be the offended party. We, we can be the one who has been trespassed against. But yet there needs to be reconciliation. The last thing very quickly. My time is well gone this morning. The overtaken brother. I want you to turn with Galatians 6 and verse 1. 
Galatians 6 and verse 1. And with this I finish just very quickly. And it says in Galatians 6 and verse 1. It says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And you know, folks, there can be the overtaken brother or sister. We go back to the word brethren. That's the same as a brother and sister in Christ, a fellow Christian, a fellow believer, united with the same feelings, objects, destiny. We'll repeat it again because that's exactly where it is. It's the very same. There's no difference. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. Christ. And it says if a person be overtaken by sudden temptation... Even as goes in here, the, the, the case of surprise. In other words, something has come into their life which even they maybe never thought would. And they're going down a long road and a wrong road, which is sometimes very hard to watch. But that's where they're going. Someone who is in some way headstrong continues to go down there. Folks, you have to, you have to go to them. But it's the idea again of restoration. That's the wonderful thing. Reconciliation. Now we're on to restoration. Set them right. Bring them back. Recover them from their fault. And put them back on the narrow way. You know Bunyan always talked about bypath meadows. How many people in, in 30 years of ministry folks. We see, I've seen going down bypath meadows. Breaks your heart. Breaks your heart. And sometimes you have to go to them. But it's with restoration. And to bring them back onto the right path. And I think it says here the spirit of meekness. We can only do it as we're spiritual men and women. That spirit of meekness it says with a kind forbearing forgiving spirit. You know it's not lording it over anyone. Sometimes it's going in with tears in your eyes and heartbroken. To explain to them ye which are spiritual. In other words under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And folks, considering ourselves, I always think of that verse there, but for the grace of God, can go I. You know, maybe folks, we know if a weaker brother needs help, we should help them. We maybe know of offended brother, we need reconciliation. We may know of a trespassing brother, we need to go to them and we need to have that reconciliation. And there's maybe an overtaken brother. We maybe need to go and speak to them, to restore them back into fellowship again. Our love for one another. Amen. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all men that he should give his only son to make a rich his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as we which more the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon a cross my sin upon his shoulders Shamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath.
Hello. 